So the handout that I sent, that I passed out, and that I sent over the thread is not mine. I'm just saying. I have, personally, I have no problem using other people's work, but I do want to make clear, like, I did not create this. Okay, this is Chuck Swindoll. <laughs> it actually says that on the bottom, so there's no way I could get away with that anyways. But I thought um, for some people, like, I give, like, a verbal overview of the book, and but for some people that are more visual or that like to have papers that you can look back and reference back to later. It's just something handy to have. And it breaks down the four chapters of the book of Colossians and uh, kind of gives like the overall theme of the book and the kind of the overall theme of each chapter and the emphasis. Uh, so uh, that's just yours to kind of look at as we go. It's just strictly for personal study purposes. I'm just going to give you a little bit of history about the letter to the Colossians before we get into it. I have to say, I know I've said this before, I am seriously loving just going through these books like this. I think maybe it's because personally I needed to get more in-depth with my study of the Word. Like, I've read the Word. But to reread it again and to slow down and try to get some of the historical context and try to glean even more from it, um, it's just really benefiting me. And if nothing else, I have a sense of peace knowing that y'all are getting the word. You're getting the word. So if you're on staff here and you don't know the word, it's because you don't want to know the word <laughs> because y'all are getting the word. Oh, my goodness. Um between uh, all the different classes that are being taught, um, Pastor Kimry going through the book of Judges, my goodness. I mean, seriously, I was learning stuff last week. I had never, I mean, I've read that book before. I've heard the stories before. But it's just like the Word of God is such a treasure, truly. Like you, every time you read it, you can get something new and fresh and deeper every single time. It's never going to run out of revelations, living word. Okay, but the letter to the Colossians is, was written by Paul uh, in the year approximately 62 during one of his imprisonments. Uh, and this is just a little bit of background, okay? This was written to the church in Colossae, uh, but Paul was not the planner. Most, most people would agree. Paul was not the planner of the church in Colossae, a man by Ep. Epaphras was, and that's, they, they get that information from verses 3 through 8, I believe, in chapter 1. We'll go over that later. But at this point, most theologians agree that Paul hadn't even personally visited Colossae. But um, people that he had come in contact with had planted there, and, um, and they had brought word back to Paul about the church in Colossae. And then that's where Paul is writing this letter. The and, and for that reason, I feel like the book of Coloss the book of Colossians it has less rebuke, maybe, and it's more of a letter of encouragement and, and, do and doctrinal instruction. And it may be because he hadn't been there personally himself to build the type of relationship to really bring, bring a stern rebuke the way he he does to the church at Corinth, or for whatever reason, um, it's. Just the book of Colossians is more doctrinal instruction and encouragement. Um, the city of Colossae was about 120 miles or about a week's walk away from Ephesus, where we know Timothy was, <clears throat> although Timothy was with Paul at the time of this letter, and about a 13-mile walk from Laod Laodicea. So, in Colossae... What was very common as far as religion-wise was polytheism. Does anybody know what polytheism means, Sheldon? <clears throat> the worship of more than one God? Yeah, exactly. It's the worship of multiple deities. It was really actually very common in Greek culture because they had a lot of different gods and a lot of different things that they worshipped. Um, polytheism basically is... You have a God for everything. <laughs> so it's like uh, you need rain, let's pray to the rain God. You need your crops to grow, let's pray, pray to the God that causes the crops to grow. 
very common. Um, as well as something I found that was interesting it, about the city of Colossae was they had um, more than any other place in uh, Rome at that time, they had uh, more worship of angels. And that's because ancient civilizations in Colossae believed that at one point the Mike, Michael the archangel had come down to that, to that place and had opened up a spring of living water, therapeutic water, healing water. And because of that, um, Michael the archangel and several other, other of the angels, like Gabriel and Raphael, and there was another name that I can't pronounce, but it started with an O, they worshipped and prayed to. And actually, um, archaeologists have found like amulets and stuff that were made in that time period. So they would wear amulets that had depictions of these so-called angels on them, along with prayers, <clears throat> prayers for, for protection, prayers to guard their properties and their families, and um, all these things. I thought it was interesting that the depiction of the angels that were on these amulets that were found was actually, it had the head of a rooster and the legs of a snake. And these snakes for its legs. These were the angels they were worshiping. So that kind of gives you, to me, I'm thinking, that doesn't sound like one of God's angels. Uh, and if you read the Bible, anytime a man tries to worship an angel, the angel will rebuke the man and say, no, don't worship me. I'm only, an, I'm only a messenger. It's just all throughout the Bible. So I feel like there was a lot of probably deception uh, where they thought they were worshiping something that was good. And actually, they were deceived by fallen spirits. And that was like ancient civilization, Colossae. Okay, so all of that stuff, including Greek, the uh, Greek polytheism, the multiple gods, was all kind of going on in that, in that place um, at the time that Paul's writing this letter. And then another thing that um, he's dealing with in this letter is you have those Jewish religion like diehard Jewish religious people that it seems like they're following after Paul and trying to clean up his doctrinal theology messes or something. It's like, if you read out throughout the letters of Paul, it seems like he'll go and he'll plant a church or something, something, you know, um, the gospel comes and people start getting on fire for God and a move of God is taking place. And then you have this religious group that seems to rear up and start saying, okay, this is good, but you still got to be circumcised. You still have to do this. You still have to do this. Jesus is good, but you also have to do this. Which, again, is sort of a form of polytheism. So I don't want us to get too judgmental, honestly, about the church at Colossae, because American churches also t frequently tend to mix Christianity with polytheism. It just looks a little different. Maybe we're not worshiping Zeus and archangels and all of these things. But think about it. Think about the average churchgoer. Okay? And really, I'm talking about, you know, an average Christian. I'm not talking about a, a, a disciple. That really, it's like, yeah. Jesus heals, but you also need your medicine. Like, Jesus isn't enough. Or, yeah, Jesus saves, but you also have to do this and this and this. And, yeah, Jesus is Lord over this country, but if Trump was president, then we would really succeed. Like, Jesus himself isn't enough. I mean, seriously, it looks different, but it's the same spirit of trying to serve multiple gods and then just throwing Jesus in the mix like he's just one of the many ones that you need. So that's kind of what was going on in the Church of Colossae. So you'll see that um, it's partly, and I th partly for this reason that um, in the first two chapters of Colossians, Paul just really, oh my gosh, he gives some of the most beautiful poetic descriptions of Jesus, I believe, in the whole Bible. There's a few chapters out of the whole Bible that I just, I feel like 
it just it's just written so beautifully and it just describes Jesus in such a way. Um, Isaiah 53 is one, Gospel of John chapter one is one, and then Colossians one and two, I feel. Just my personal favorites. But he uh, Paul is he just goes into so much depth about the supremacy of Jesus and how he is before all things and he's in all things and in him all things hold together. And the reason he emphasizes this point so strongly is because he's trying to break through this mentality that, um, yes, Jesus is good, but we also need this other stuff. And he's saying, like, Jesus is literally all you need. Forget about the religious man-made traditions. You don't need that stuff. Jesus is what you need. Forget about these other deities. They're all lesser when compared to Jesus. We'll we'll get into that in a minute. So chapters 1 and 2 lay the foundation of Jesus as Supreme Lord and Savior. Chapters 3 and 4 basically detail how our lives and relationships and behaviors should look when it's based upon the truth of who Christ really is. <clears throat> so, if you've got a Bible, go to Colossians 1. We're just, I'm going to try to get through uh, chapters 1 and 2 today, and then next week we'll, we'll finish it up with chapters 3 and 4. How many of y'all have read this recently? Okay. We're still hanging around that 50% mark. I would really love to see, like, 100% of y'all raise your hands, but we'll get there. It's Just so you know, it's for the sake of all you that don't raise your hands is why I feel it's necessary to go through this verse by verse. So if you're tired of doing this with me, then, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. We'll keep on doing it. Okay. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren of Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus because of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit and is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also has declared to us your love in the spirit. So it's those verses right there is why theologians think um, Paul had not been there personally, so that the message of the gospel they've heard, they heard from Epaphras, and and the Epaphras was, um, actually, Paul mentions Epaphras at the last part of Philemon, that uh, Epaphras was there with Paul while he was imprisoned in Rome, but anyway. For this reason also, since the day we've heard it, we do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Let's go to verse 11, and then I want to ask you all a question. Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy. Okay, so verse 9, and Paul is telling them what they're praying for the church in Colossae. And it says, We do not cease to pray and ask that you be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So, do we have a mic? Somebody tell me, I just want kind of want feedback. What's the difference between knowledge, wisdom, and spiritual understanding? What do you think? Oh, microphone, sir. Knowledge is uh, knowledge is what we gain from my uh, reading, reading books and stuff. Wisdom, I believe, is from my uh, we gain wisdom through going through stuff and the wisdom to understand. You know what I mean? What the difference is, and uh, 
spiritual understanding, uh, I'm not real sure on that. But I guess what we what we gain spiritually from prayer and stuff, that understanding in that sense, would that be about right? Yeah. Anybody else have anything? <clears throat> Jacob. Uh, like you said, knowledge is more of the knowing. So that's actually like having an intimate conversation or getting to know him through his word, uh, your personal prayer time, just talking to him like you would a normal person. The wisdom would be gaining from experience, from exerting faith and hope in his word and, you know, just allowing his patience to rest in you so you have the strength to wait. <laughs> um, spiritual understanding, it's when your spirit and heart and mind is aligned with his will, I believe, because, I mean, then you're walking in his spirit and you're, and you're just doing what he's asking you to do out of his will, mm -hmm. not your own. Anybody else? Knowledge, like uh, Justin said, knowledge is something that can be gained in private. Um, wisdom is what you, how you uh, apply your knowledge in public. Mm -hmm. um, and I think all, both of those tie together well, especially with spiritual understanding. And um, we can read the word, but not be doers of the word. And um, we feel like so because we've seen one thing one way all the time, we feel like that's the way it has to be. But Christ may be saying that isn't the way it needs to be. It needs to be some way different. So you begin to gain wisdom through the spiritual understanding. Okay. So would you say that a religious spirit is full of knowledge but lacks the true spiritual understanding? Because really, if you read the scriptures, even the devil can quote the word of God. He misappropriates it or uses it out of context because knowledge alone without the spiritual understanding of what the Spirit of God is actually saying, knowledge alone will actually destroy you. Uh, Pastor Andrew, I'm going to grab this. I was looking up real quick on that. I was looking up the... Um, trying to look up the Greek words for understanding wisdom and knowledge. And I wanted to say that the word for understanding in this context for this in the Greek was, uh, I can't pronounce it, but it looked like a very similar word to like synthesis or, syner you know, like synonyms. Like it, and the, the definition actually was like flowing together. Huh. Like, like at, through the wisdom and knowledge and, and all that kind of stuff, it's like you get into alignment with his will. And that's part of understanding is you coming into alignment. I, I, I feel like it's a, the way it's worded, it, it's almost like an organic thing. Like it just happens naturally as a part of gaining your wisdom and, and gaining your knowledge and applying it through wisdom and things. It's a natural coming into natural alignment with his will. That's good. That's good. And Paul says the reason that we need this, and it's, it's really evident, verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. So uh, I just wanted to stop there because I felt like that's very applicable to us, especially being in ministry. The study of the word is absolutely vital. The Bible says study to show yourself approved, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. But it's got to go beyond just gaining knowledge you know you've got to know god on an intimate level to be able to recognize and discern his voice to be able to rightly divide the scripture you've got to be able to discern through spiritual wisdom what um the spirit is speaking through the scriptures because there are colleges that are filled with professors that can quote the word of god but um, lack lack true spiritual authority or power because the application is not there and then the true spiritual understanding is not there as well. So. All right, let's keep going. Verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance in the saints, of the saints in the light. And here he just gives us... <clears throat> salvation summary. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his son of love, of the son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And I just, I love these next few verses. They're so beautiful. 
He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. Some translations say in verse 17 say, and in him all things hold together, and I love that. Verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and that by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And I just want to stop there. I love um, verse 19. It pleased the Father that in him, meaning Jesus, in Jesus, all the fullness should dwell. When you exalt Jesus, you're not depriving Father God of his glory. And when you magnify Jesus, you're not hurting the Holy Spirit's feelings. <laughs> I just want to say, like, everything is contained within Jesus. And, and, and I want to say this, too. He earned it rightfully. Yeah. It's not like uh, God was like, uh, boom, I'm just going to lay this on you. God's a just God. Jesus earned that the right to have the fullness dwell, dwelling in him through his choice to um, put on flesh, to walk out a sinless life, and to, to basically put himself on the cross and to go through everything he went through out of love uh, for us and love for the Father. But he earned, he, he, he earned every single accolade that is ascribed to him. Jesus earned it. And it, it, it just, you can never, ever run out of fresh revelation about who Jesus is, because in him the fullness dwells. Think about that for a minute. What is the fullness? Did you have your hand up or it was a separate question? Can we answer what the fullness is? Oh, or what, ask a question. You ask your question first. Uh, Whichever you want to do, sir. Dude. Whatever. I mean, I was, anyway, <laughs> it's going to take a shot at it. I was just wondering, I don't know, you might want to finish that before I ask the question because it's going to, it's a whole different kind of thing. But anyway, I just wonder why he says, I know he's trying to tie both of them together because I guess since they're in polytheism, maybe they don't want them to think there's different gods, like God the Father and then Jesus Christ or whatever. I don't, I mean, that's what it looks like. But why does he say the firstborn of all creation? The firstborn, oh, I actually was going to talk about that. That actually makes it look like he's created, you know? Yeah. Um, The firstborn of all creation, gosh, I was studying this. I can't remember what I read. It doesn't mean that he was the first thing that was created, it means that he was before all that was created, is how it translates out. he before all anything that was created, he was already existing. Does that make sense? Or am I? You know, am I not? I can't. I'm having a hard time. Ex- I mean, you can elaborate. It's it's kind of hard. To, well, it's kind of hard to explain because you know he was always there, but then it says he was the firstborn those that were created, but he was actually the creator himself. So how do you explain that one, right? If he was the creator himself, how was he then the firstborn that was created? Right? So I I believe what what he's kind of alluding to here is like uh, another portion of Scripture says he was the firstborn among many brethren. So when we're talking about that being born again, he was the first to be born again, in a sense. Like, remember, that's why he, 
went to John the Baptist, and he went down in the water. He went through the whole protocol of everything. He got baptized and filled with the Spirit. You know, the Spirit ascended upon him. Um, and he's, he's, it's kind of showing that there's a pattern that you have to go through when you're born into the flesh, you know, to be again once born into the Spirit. And he was the first one to actually be born again in a sense, you know. <clears throat> kind of a pretty deep subject. You know? I just got a question because we're talking about worshiping multiple gods. Uh -huh. uh, so when we're worshiping Jesus or God, it's basically doing uh, it's one. Of, I mean, we're doing the same worshiping the same person, right? I mean, it's not any different. I mean, should the praise be different for Jesus than it is for God, or like? I'm just, no, I, mean, I'm I little... think that's kind of why Paul is emphasizing so much about in Christ the fullness of the Godhead dwells. is because when you praise one, you're praising all three because they're, they're one. And he's trying to kind of tie it all together so that they're not thinking like, I've got to pray to the Holy Spirit. Now I'm done praying to the Holy Spirit. I've got to come over here and pray to Father God. If I don't pray to Father God, I'm going to hurt. I mean, if I don't pray to Jesus, I'm going to hurt somebody. You know, it's like you just worship Jesus. <laughs> And the and, and God is glorified. I my kids have so many questions about this, and I'm going to tell you, it is difficult to explain in children's church. It's difficult to explain to an adult. I'm like, honestly, I get it logically, my sort of, sort of, but even like it doesn't make. I'm like, this is it's like a mystery. There's three, but there's one, and um. It's just really hard for our minds to grasp, but I think Paul is really trying to tie them all together and say, like, uh, that Jesus is the image of God, and in him the fullness dwells. So he's just trying to bring it back to Jesus and elevate Jesus above every other thing. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. The best way I know how to describe it where they can understand, because you get a lot of questions in the classroom, is <clears throat> we're three-part being body, soul, spirit. So <clears throat> if I'm going to have a relationship with Brandy, I can't just say, well, okay, so I'm just going to know your, your mind, will, and your emotions, and uh, your body, and then your spirit. I don't want nothing to do with that to me. So, I mean, so there's three parts, but there's one person, and that's about the only way I know how to best explain it. Yeah. It's good. Okay. Let me see. Verse 21. All right, verse 21. And you were who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet he has now reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which Paul, I, Paul, became a minister. He makes an interesting statement. I'm just curious what you all think about that statement in verse 23 when he says, the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven. What do you think he's talking about? He says the gospel has been preached, been preached to every creature under heaven. You have thoughts, any thoughts on that, Apostle? Well, if, he, if it was preached to every creature under heaven, the first thing that came into my mind was like he, he went into the underworld and preached it too. You know, he went into hell and preached it. Um... I don't really, I don't really know how it was preached to every creature under heaven, though, at that time, because like it hadn't gone forth yet. You know what I mean? So uh, I really don't know. Well, I know he went into hell and he preached to the souls that were held captive down there, and that, he might be alluding to that point. I was thinking of also what Paul wrote in Romans 1 where he said that God has made his attributes clearly visible through the works of his creation so that man is without excuse. I mean, I thought maybe that, that could be also alluding to that. Like, throughout creation, it, 
in the miracle of birth, you know, in, in just the different things that you see it, that, it, that are in creation that are so miraculous, it's like you see, we'll see the gospel message, shadows of it throughout creation, if that, if that makes sense. Is that, I don't know if that's confusing. That may have confused more than it helped. Go ahead. I almost kind of see it as, since this is a letter, I almost see it as like when someone's talking, he's like, I've, I've done told everybody. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, since it's, he's just kind of like writing to him and saying like, I, of which I became that kind of minister, which there was no one that I passed by, every creature under earth that I, I ministered to about that. You yeah. know? So um, it's all, because it's a part of this, um, like you're saying, the instruction in chapter one, but also the encouragement. So if he's saying like, you know, you're not alone in this. I've already talked to everyone I've came across. Now he begins to move into, that's kind of how I viewed it. No, not that's necessarily good. overly, you know. Yeah, no, I think that's good too. Did you have something, Mark? Yeah, uh, I guess that's, you know, that's why we're, we go, you know, we're not to be afraid, you know, to go into the darkness and pull these souls out, these lost souls out. You know, Andrew? I was thinking too, because, uh, because this maybe this is, and, and this might tie with what, what James was saying, but maybe because he's writing specifically to the church in Colossae, he's speaking specifically just to that region, you know, like everybody here has heard the gospel. Yeah. You know, and, you know, all the, yeah, all the creation in this area or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Michelle, may I stand up? Uh, in the message translation, this is how it reads. Uh, there is no other message just like this one. Every creature under heaven gets the same message. So I was like, yeah, maybe it's just he's talking about everybody's going to get the same message. You know? Yeah, that's for everybody, and it's the same. It's not changing. That's good. I like that. That's good. That's kind of line. I was on. Um, <laughs> Mine says, indeed, you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation. So it's like a proclamation of the cross, you know. When he was on the cross, he proclaimed the goodness. And since every knee will bow, mm -hmm. um, every knee, I don't care who you are, um, it's kind of the same thing. It's, a, it's not in a chronological time, I don't think, you know, what he's speaking. I think it's just uh, before... Your life's over. You will hear the gospel. You will have hope because it gives us a measure of hope. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then it's basically your choice what to do with it. I'd say. Yeah, I think that's good, Daryl. That book report. Um, I did uh, finish up yesterday on uh, the Final Quest by Rick Joyner. Mm -hmm. Um, he even says that even Satan knows God's word more than most Christians do. So, like, it just goes to show that the word is, you know, thick and through, like, at, in the beginning of times, too. So, yeah. I just wanted to share that because I, I read that in that book. That was one of the quotes that he had. So. Well, and if you think about what God said about his word, um, that he said that it's living, it's active, that every word, it does not, it's not void, but it will accomplish what it's sent to do. So, in a sense... The gospel has already been released to the entire world, but it's just maybe up to us to carry it to them. Does that make sense? Like the word's already out there and it won't stop until it's completed its purpose. And it is for everyone. I like how the message said that. That's good. The gospel is for everyone. Verse 24. I now rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up my, fill up what, it, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. What? This is, I, I'm just trying to get y'all's input on this. What do y'all think he's referring to? Making up, okay. Filling up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Um, Verse 25, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Thoughts? He literally has taken himself out of the equation. He's just preaching strictly from the spirit who is from God, which he dwells. So, I mean, 
I don't think it's him at all. It's the Spirit speaking to everybody through the words that he writes and everything. Okay. Anybody else? Remember, Paul's imprisoned while he's writing this. <clears throat> and I can't remember, is it 2 Corinthians where Paul gives a list of all of the different things he's had to endure? Like five times, was it five times he was beaten with 39 lashes? And stoned how many times and uh, left for dead? And he gives this, is it 2 Corinthians where he gives that? I think it's the, near the end of 2 Corinthians. But Paul endured in the, in the time of his ministry a lot of physical persecution. And in many, many different places, he doesn't wear it as a, a badge to gain pity. It's a badge of honor that he was able to share in the sufferings of Christ. I always thought that was, it was actually a joy to him, uh, I don't know how you get to that point. <laughs> Suffering for the sake of the gospel was um, to him an honor because he was able to partake in the suffering of Christ. Like, how do you get to that point? Because <laughs> I don't even like to endure a bad day. Well, it, it, I think this, this kind of goes back to what the comment that Jesus made when he said, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. So, you know, you, Christ kind of sets the pattern of what it's supposed to look like for, for a Christian or a disciple, you know, of how their life's supposed to be led. He sets the pattern by going to the cross, right? And, and for suffering for the sins of mankind. Nobody can do that. All right. However, however, he does make the comment, if you're going to come after me, take up your cross, deny yourself, right? And this is what Paul is saying. He's, he's picking up where Christ left off, right? So every disciple of Christ has to have that mentality. If you're really going to do anything, guys, that's going to stand through eternity and that's going to bring radical change in the, in the people's lives, you're going to have to suffer for it. You will. That's just is what it is, man. You know, uh, you're going to have to lay down your life for a sacrifice. You're going to have to endure persecution. You're going to have to endure people coming against you. You know, maybe even be in prison, maybe be beaten. Who knows what could happen? But these are the things that a real disciple will endure for the sake of getting this message into the hearts and minds of other people. And this is what Paul is doing. He, he fought through a lot of affliction. He fought through the government and the politics and the people and the false religions in order to get the remnant that God had called him to and draw them out. And he knew that he'd have to suffer for it. And he's okay with it. He's like, I'm cool with it. I'm making up I'm where, where, where Jesus left off. I'm picking up. That's the mentality we got to have. To go exactly along with what he just said, listen what the message says, the translation. I want you to know how glad I am that it's me sitting here in this jail and not you. There's a lot of suffering to be entered into this world, the kind of suffering Christ takes on. I welcome the chance to take my share in the church's part of that suffering. When I become a servant in this church, I experience the suffering as a sheer gift, God's way of helping me serve you, laying out the whole truth. Well, according to the Word of God, if you want to be partakers in His glory, you've also got to be a partaker in His sufferings. And that's the problem with most of the American church today is that we want the glory, but without the suffering. <laughs> Give me that quick, easy glory. That doesn't cost anything. Guess what? That doesn't come from God. Okay, let's keep going. Verse 26. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we should present every man perfect in Jesus Christ. 
To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. And as for many <clears throat> as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Okay, let's stop right there. In Christ, in whom all in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In the a couple of times in the last few verses, Paul uses the word mystery and um, secrets and things that are hidden, and that she's really speaking to kind of um, the culture. Uh, Greeks loved to uh, sit and philosophize. <laughs> That's a word. Is that a word? Am I say Anyways, I don't even think I'm saying that correctly. They love to discuss philosophy. There we go. That sounds, that sounds better. And they always wanted to be searching out the deeper mystery, the deeper mystery, the deeper mystery. And this is where uh, actually a lot of the angel worship came into play in Colossae is because they believed when you prayed to the angels, the angels would come and impart to you some hidden mystery. Probably some demonic mystery, truthfully. But anyways... The, the angels would come and impart to you hidden mystery. And he's saying that the mysteries, in verse 26, chapter 1, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to the saints. He's saying, and then he goes on to say, all of them in, in verse um, 2 and 3, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this is what he's saying. If, if you are hungry for the deeper things, then don't pursue after other deities and, and, and don't pursue after knowledge. Pursue Christ because in him is hidden all the mysteries, all the wisdom, all the understanding from the beginning of time. It's all contained in Christ. And this is, it's just, it, ah, there's no greater revelation than any human being can ever receive than, than the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the cool thing about the revelation of Jesus Christ is that no matter how much you know about him right now, there's a greater depth of him that he wants to show you. And there's another element to him and there's another side he wants to reveal to you. You can never run out of fresh revelation about Jesus. You can know the words, you can quote the word, and that's good. But to really know Jesus, if you, the more you pursue Jesus, God will continually unfold the mysteries of the kingdom to you. And you'll not only know the mysteries of the kingdom, but you'll understand even your place in that kingdom. And all of that is contained in Jesus. So he's just encouraging them there like the mysteries of the universe are set aside, they're hidden in Jesus, and God has set them there for the saints. And I believe the purpose of that is, for one, to conceal them from the powers of darkness, and for two, because um, it, it, it creates in us a need to search him out. That's what I believe about that. But there's no greater, greater revelation than the revelation of Jesus. That's why um, when I'm praying or ministering to to anybody that's just like, you know, they're floundering or I don't know how to pray or whatever. I, just, I always pray that. Give us a revelation of Jesus. Holy Spirit, show us another aspect of Jesus. Take me to a deeper place of seeing Jesus. Because um, the image that we have of Jesus often is very, very watered down based on however we've grown up or been taught or been experienced. I'll well, I don't want to step on any toes, but it is what it is, okay? Catholicism is another form of polytheism because they pray to multiple saints for protection and 
you know, it's like pray to Jesus, but also pray to all these other saints. And it's kind of, they're kind of like they're on the same playing field in a sense. And <clears throat> there is, for, even in this time, there was the spirit, I believe it's the spirit of Antichrist, trying to infiltrate the church of the living God to give a watered-down version of Jesus, like a less powerful, less supreme version of Jesus. So I, I really believe that the leaders in Rome and, and ultimately the Antichrist spirit realize the gospel can't be stopped. It's going to be preached, and it's growing at a rapid rate. And the more you try to stop it and persecute it, the faster it grows. So let's just try to water down Jesus and present a weaker, lesser Jesus that is, you know, he's good and he's powerful, but yet you still need this other stuff. Does that make sense? I read that quote. It's A.W. Tozer. I read it um, on Wednesday. And I'm probably going to misquote it now, but he said something along the lines of Christianity is weak because their God is weak. Meaning your view of how strong or how weak Jesus is, is going to be directly reflected in the amount of power that you operate in. And if we think that, you know, man, Jesus is strong. Yes, he's a healer, but I also need this. Then your view, view of Jesus you need a fresh revelation of Jesus. Because in all reality, you need Jesus and nothing else. Not a cup of coffee. Hopefully nobody's wearing that shirt in here today. <laughs> all I need is Jesus and a cup of coffee. I'm like, girl, you don't need no coffee. You do need Jesus, though. But you don't need Jesus and an IBU. You don't need Jesus and something else. Literally all you need is Jesus. But our view of him is so watered down and weakened that we, we often try to supplement the gospel with other things. It's kind of what Paul's dealing with here. Did you have your... Okay. So, moving on. Verse 4. Not that I should now... Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words... For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Jesus Christ. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy or empty deceit, according to the tradition of man, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, and he, he emphasizes this again as he did in chapter 1, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. You see how he's really hammering this issue? Like, in Christ is the fullness of everything. And there's not an angel, there's not a demon, there's not a principality or power that's not subject to him. They're, they're all beneath him. And, and as a matter of fact, they were all created by him. This is why I, tell, I try to tell the students all the time, like, look, Jesus and the devil are not in a competition. The devil, uh, although he does have power that's been uh, allotted to him, everything that he has has been given to him, and even he himself is a created thing. So a creator is not in uh, rivalry with its creation. I know that like we get this idea of like you got the good angel and the bad angel and there's like this war going on. That's that's not how it is with Jesus. Like in him the fullness of the Godhead dwells, and he is all in all. And you, verse ten, are complete in him. So he's saying there's nothing else that you need. Oh, if we could just get this, if America's church could just get this, think about the healings that we would see if we really believed this. I know we we teach it and we say it and it sounds awesome, but like if you really believed it with the very core of your being, that in him is everything, and and you don't need anything outside of him, and in him you are complete, it says. 
I think about the kind of miracles we could see if we really got this in our spirits, like really got it. In him, and now he's he, now he's going to deal with some of the legalism that's coming from the the um, those diehard Jewish people. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you are also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwritten handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Oh, this is such a good one too. Verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. He made a public spectacle out of your adversary. I just love that. Disarming them, openly openly making a public display of his victory over them. Just so good. When it talks about the handwriting of requirements that was against us, it's literally talking... Um, Oh, where's where's my notes here? Um, uh, about a legal, uh, it, the I was reading this in my Perry Stone Bible. Like it was almost like a legal document, like a a bill, a debt, a bond. <laughs> That's what was against us was the debt of sin that could never be paid. Okay, verse sixteen. So let no one judge you in food or drink or in regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So what he's saying here is all those things were, were fine and they were, they were good, they, but they were all pointing to Christ. So don't think now that you have the fullness of Christ that if you don't continue in those things that were the shadow, that somehow you're falling short, the, that Christ is the fullness of all those things which were the shadow. Verse 18, let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and the worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up in his fleshly mind, not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why... As though living in the world, do you subject yourself to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. All Which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. For these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in, a self, in self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh." What is he talking about there? I know we just read a lot of scripture, but I just want to tie this up. What is he talking about? Um, the All of these things which have the appearance of wisdom in, self, um, in self-imposed religion and false humility and neglect of the body, but have no value against the indulgence of the flesh. What do you all think that means? Go ahead. <laughs> um, that well, he. I mean, he just made a big case that that Jesus is uh, all authority is in Jesus, and so anything else that we do, other than that, especially trying to make ourselves look small, so that uh, and uh, whatever we do uh, to try to be circumcised, other than through Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. uh, is not going to have any effect. You know. Especially bring joy out of that. So that's what it looks like he's talking about. Okay, Andrew? I think a lot of what it is is like a, a lot of the um, the rules and stuff were there because it was like, you know, we didn't have the Spirit of God living in us. Mm-hmm. And so we had to be told what not to touch, what not to taste, what not to handle and all these different things. But now that we have the Spirit living in us, 
we don't have to focus on those things instead of instead of trying to always just do this this is focus on the things that are going to feed our spirit mm -hmm. in the law what was lacking as far as um even in our obedience to the law there was still something lacking what was that thing relationship okay and love. um i was just going to say a little more about what you'd asked is they this is still new to a lot of people then in the context mm -hmm. you know so um Paul sending that letter, there's still a lot of people that, well, that's not the way my family has always done it. You know, well, do I have to keep doing this? And that ties over to our church today because we feel like, well, this is the way we've always done it. You know, or, um, well, I know that this is how, if you do this, this, and this, and the presence will show up. You know, it isn't, it isn't about that anymore. It's now about the relationship, the indwelling. So, so. But I want, to, I, want to talk this I want to go back to verse 14, guys. It says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. So back in the Old Testament, when, when God gave Moses the laws and the precepts, there was a lot of stipulations like you have to honor these particular new moons and holy days and sabbath days and feasts and then there was a lot of other ordinances like of what you could eat and what you can't eat and there were ordinances of like you can't go walk by a dead thing and look at it or touch it um there was ordinances like when a woman was on her period she had to go off into the woods somewhere for seven days i mean or for five days till she bled out you know uh, she couldn't be. She couldn't be touched. She couldn't. You couldn't even get into con close contact with her. Like she, when you get in with fifty yards of her, you just violated the law. And all these things, right, were were principles that they set in motion to kind of show you what holiness was about. The thing is, is is um, nobody could live by it. It was just. It was almost impossible to live by these standards. And God knew that. God knew that when He gave them the law. However, what Pastor Andrew was saying, when the Spirit comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, then the Holy Spirit convicts you and the Holy Spirit shows you what you need to do and how you need to do it. So, you know, realizing that it's impossible to, to live by all these standards, now you have the Holy Spirit in you and He's... He's steering you in the right direction. Here's an example. Like sometimes when I'm out running in the morning, I'll run by something that's dead on the road. And it, it grieves me. It's like, ugh. And, and sometimes the Spirit, the Spirit tells me, don't look at that. Stay, stay away from that. You know? Why? Because anything that's dead... Uh, if you touch something that's dead, you could become dead if you're not careful. All right? If, if you touch something that's sinful, you could become that sin if you're not careful. If you don't have the Holy Spirit living in you and, and putting up boundaries for you and, and guarding you and protecting you and telling you and instructing you on what to do, then you, you know, you've got to be careful with these things. When you, when you go back into the holy days and the new moons and the Sabbaths and all these things, you know, these were standards that Israel had lived by. These were laws that God had gave to them, okay? Now, when Jesus Christ comes, there's this big debate uh, after He uh, resurrects. There's this big debate amongst the apostles. What, does everybody now have to live by all of these laws? And they said, no, they don't. No, they don't. Uh, as long as they're not like doing vampire acts and drinking blood and you know having being sexually immoral and things like this, the basics of this, then nobody's got to worry about holy days, new moons, Sabbath days. And Paul even goes on and he says in different portions of Scripture, you know, one man thinks that this day should be set aside. Another man thinks that every day should be treated alike. Everyone be fully persuaded in their own mind. So now there's, there's controversy on the Sabbath day, whether Saturday was the Sabbath day and it should it be honored as that day. And, and, and really the whole 
the whole principle behind it is a day of rest, one day a week to rest, you know, and I think that's good and we need to honor that, you know. That's why I kind of try to get people to rest on Sunday as much as we can. You know, I know it's difficult in here, but for the most part, I want people to sleep in and, you know, try to re regroup yourself a little bit. But all these things, guys, these laws were given. And it was like a, a, a handwritten ordinance that was, that was against mankind. Because in eternity, He's trying to show you a shadow of how things will function and operate. But what happened is, people get so caught up in trying to do every little thing right and according to this law that they miss the bigger picture. And we don't want nobody to miss the bigger picture. So, so bringing this all in to where we're at today, okay? There's a lot of rules and stuff that, that we want people to live by in here. But at the same time, don't miss the bigger picture. The bigger, the bigger picture is somebody coming into an intimate love encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, inviting the Holy Spirit into their life, and then guess what? When the Holy Spirit comes in, I don't got to tell you how to dress. I don't got to tell you that you need to be in church. I don't got to tell you that you need to pray. I shouldn't be. Because if you've had a genuine love encounter and Holy Spirit's living in you, it's like, man, He gets you up and you want to pray. He, he gives you a word in your heart and you want to go to church and you want to release it and speak it to somebody. You know? He, he's, he's convicting you about when you look at that little cutie pie that walks by. Uh-huh. See, the Spirit's in you now. And the Spirit... It, you know, by the Spirit being able to dwell in you, that, that kind of, you know, what Christ did on the cross allows the Spirit to dwell in you, and it, and it wipes away the handwriting of ordinances, okay? So we can't get too caught up in obeying every little rule. I mean, we set these things in motion because, you know, it's a standard of holiness, but, however, the reality is Christ in you. Christ in you. Christ in me. And if He's really there, if He's really there, the things that we ask you to do around here, they're not that hard. They're really not. And then you start seeing why. And you start understanding why. You know, and then it goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning, about knowledge and understanding and wisdom. Because we know to, to do it, or we know not to do it, but sometimes we don't understand why. The Holy Spirit comes in, helps us to understand why. And now we're like, man, I do it because I want to do it, not because I'm told to do it. Amen? Okay. Hope that kind of summed everything up and pulled it together. It was good. So, and that's what Paul is getting at, actually, in several of his letters. Is like, is it wrong to follow the... New, the new moons and the festivals and the Jewish traditions. No, it's not wrong, but that's not what saves you. And is it wrong to have the uh, boys circumcised on the eighth day or whatever? No, that's not wrong. And if, you know, if that's what you believe that you should do, then do it. But that's not what saves you. The, all that you need is Jesus. I just want to leave you all this one last question. Why do you think that so far, every letter we've read of Paul, we've had to deal with this same um, religious spirit that when there's a move of God, the n next thing that comes in, it seems like to hinder that move is this religious spirit. Why do you think that it's so stubborn, the spirit of religion and man's tradition? Why do you think it's uh, so hard to get rid of in the church in today's time? Because we still see it going on today. I think because it's the physical sense more so than it is a spiritual sense. People see it day to day, they see it on TV, or they, you know, back then they've just probably seen it in the church, you know, they, they went to church a lot more often than they actually, you know, they had Pharisees and Sadducees that were constantly going around giving order and direction, they, I mean, it was written on tablets and all these things, I mean, people just physically seen it all, they didn't have the spiritual awakening, awakening until, you know, they accepted Jesus, I think that's mainly the 
reason behind a lot of it is physical sins. So do you think that's still the issue today, like in today's church? Because even there will be a, like a move of God, and then it will be a short amount of time before you see that religion trying, trying to pop itself up and say, okay, now this is the way that things have to be done. This is the tradition, and we're going to make a new doctrine out of this move. Yeah. People are more and more trying to conform with the world and what the world accepts. So the world accepts sin as the norm nowadays, and that's where I, I feel part of the problem is, you know. We as a church know better than that, but then we go out and we do worldly things because we are of this world. And uh, being, like he said, everything's on TV, homosexuality is okay now, you can get married in different states if you're a homo and, and whatnot, it's the norm. So this is what people are accustomed to seeing, therefore they try to follow along. Hence some of the churches break off denominations and say, well, we're Methodists, it's okay to be gay, We'll just tiptoe around these scriptures. You know, I ain't trying to step on nobody's feet as Methodist. But then even they have branched off in the different branches of Methodist. So. I think another thing, too, is uh, the one thing that always pops in my mind is there's a scripture that talks about God being a God of order. Mm -hmm. And people have their own personal understanding of what order is. What I may think is order is different than what Daryl thinks is order. And so, like, for example, like when I was raised up in the assemblies of God, if somebody, you know, gave a message in tongues, there was always a pause and you Quiet waited pause. for somebody to give the interpretation. But then when we were sometimes when we were going to summit, there would be a message in tongues and immediately that person that gave the message immediately translated. Mm -hmm. And when I first heard that, I, when I first heard, saw it happen that way, I was like, that ain't right. You're supposed to pause. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And you're supposed to wait and let the, let the you know, and, 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 and so I think sometimes we, we have our own views of what order is, or, you know, and that because we have our own views of what order is, that gives the, that, that, that gives the religious spirit the ability to like, immediately jump in there. Amen. Miss Tracy. I think it's because we have we understand a form of godliness, but the power, we deny the power, they didn't have the power and or they did have it and they did they don't know that they denied it. Um, and I also think that uh, also uh, the familiarity with things, they say familiarity breeds contempt, and what's happening is we're treating the things of God common, mm -hmm. and I think that that's probably a lot of it. Yeah. I believe that behind the religious spirit ultimately is the spirit of Antichrist, and it's a lot about having to do with control, meaning my own thinking, man's thinking of what's right and wrong, what's order and what's not order, supersedes the revelation of Jesus Christ. So if the move of God doesn't fall in alignment with what I think it should look like, therefore the movement's wrong, not me. I'm not out of alignment. The movement's out of alignment. So, um, and really... Just remember this, a spirit of religion will always try to lessen the power of Jesus and make it more fit, fitting to your personal preference or tradition. And um, it just, it, it, you're, we're going to see it more and more in these last days. Um, and so I, I, guess, I guess I just want to leave the, the, you with this, leave the, the class with this note. I want to challenge you in the next few weeks to make it a point in your prayer time to begin to seek the Holy Spirit to bring you a deeper revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, because I guarantee he'll show you another part of Jesus that you'd be like, whoa, I didn't even realize this about Jesus. So much R religion is in place because we think Jesus is insufficient. Does that make sense? Jesus is not enough, therefore I must do these things in order to supplement where he's lacking. When we really get a full understanding of Jesus, 
I'm telling you, we're going we're gonna to see signs, wonders, and miracles in this place. So, God, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus that by the power of your spirit and the truth of your word, Lord, that you would take us into a deeper revelation of Jesus individually and, and as a ministry, God. That our, uh, our own opinions and our own views uh, would take a back seat to the true revelation of Jesus Christ, God, and that, um, God, you would break down any barriers that would hinder our minds from seeing you in your power and in your authority, Lord God. Anything that we've been taught, Lord, that would portray you as being not enough or insufficient or weak in any way, God, I pray that Holy Spirit, you would reveal those to us, that you would break those down in our minds and just really bring us into a fresh new revelation of Jesus. We I bless these men and women in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.